I was born in Poland in a city called Łódź. It was the second largest city with a population of almost 260 or thousand. We had a nice apartment. I had my own bedroom. My grandfather had his own business. It was a chemical business. On the 3rd of September 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. So within six weeks, the whole of Poland was occupied by German troops. The day they came into our town, our city, everything changed. First of all, no Jewish child was allowed to go to school. No Jewish teacher was allowed to teach. It didn't matter whether he was teaching in a Jewish school or a non-Jewish school, he wasn't allowed. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, nothing. They weren't allowed to practice their professions. And every morning we used to get up, new decrees were coming out, posters up. No Jew is allowed to travel on public transport. We had trams there. If they caught a Jew, they realized he was Jewish, the way he was dressed, or with a beard, they slung him off the bus. Irrespective whether the bus was stationary or movie. If they found a Jew walking on the pavement, they cut his beard off. If they were near a shop, they went in, got the bucket of water, made him wash the pavement, just to humiliate him for no reason. And of course, hunger started because there wasn't much food to go around. The farmers, Polish farmers, were frightened to come into the city. In November 1939, a poster came out, every Jew has got to go to a designated area. We were left with about 150,000 people. There was enough room, maximum, you know, for about 20,000 people to live normal life. We finished up, the three of us finished up with one solitary room, no bathroom, no toilet, no running water. You wanted to go to the toilet, you went downstairs. You wanted water as well, you had to go downstairs. Can you imagine 20 below zero? So by April the 4th, it was completely surrounded by barbed wire. You couldn't get in, you couldn't get out. Beating didn't worry us. The amount of time we were beaten, it didn't matter because, beat, you know, the pain goes away and you're right. Hunger never goes away. And a lot of people were dying from starvation, you know, this disease. And a lot of people were committing suicide. And I always used to ask my grandmother, why are they committing suicide? Surely they want to live. You know, it took me years and years to find out later why they were doing this. Can you imagine a mother losing a child or two children from disease or starvation? She didn't want to live. Or the father. And they were killing themselves. And then I used to go down the stairs and stepping over dead bodies. And I didn't even look, I didn't even think about it. I didn't say, oh my God, no, nothing. It didn't mean anything to me. All I was hoping that one o'clock or 12 o'clock will come and I'll get a drop of soup that we were getting. In the morning they came with big lorries and uh, we had to go down, you know, downstairs. And they took me and they slung me onto the lorry. You know, when they slung me onto the lorry, I looked who was there. There were babies, there were children, there were old people, disabled people. And I thought, they're going to take us to the nearest woods and shoot us. And I jumped off the lorry. Now that's where, where my luck was. First of all, the lorry was moving. And secondly, the guards were inside the yard. Had they seen me, they would have shot me. There was never a question, stop or I'll show me. In the evening, I went back to where we lived after a few days. We went back to work and they had took all those people. Nobody had a thing of all those people that left. Not a sound, not a letter, not nothing. We assumed they killed them somewhere and buried them. Because in them days they didn't have crematorium, they didn't have gas chambers. We worked there, like I said, and all the time, you know, people were dying. And once I said to my grandmother, you know, so many people have died, so many people, they went away, there must be more room. They were bringing in other people from small places, from Germany even. They brought people into the lodge ghetto. 1944, the Germans came, the SS came, and they said 
to the people that were running the ghetto, they said we want to liquidate the ghetto because the Russians are getting near, they're already outside Warsaw, outside the Vistula River. They said we've got the people in the metal factory, if you want to go to Germany to work in a metal factory, they'll take us. When we came to the railway station, the first thing I said to my grandmother, I can't see any trains. She said, they're standing in front of you. I said, they're cattle trucks. She said, that's all there is. Anyway, they opened the shutters and we had to get in there. They packed us in. There was no way you could sit down. Can you imagine a boy of 14 hoping people should die so he'll have room to sit down? What has become of me? After a few days, <laughs> unfortunately, there was more room to sit down. We're traveling for another three or four days. One early morning, through slits of the truck, you could see the word Auschwitz. I didn't know what it meant. Underneath it said Auschwitzim, and I, somebody said, oh, that's a little town near Krakow. They opened those shutters. They told us to leave our luggage, our suitcases, and we had to get out, jump off from there. Can you imagine? children or old people or disabled jumping off a truck. There, most of you have been there that are here tonight, so you know where I arrived in Birkenau. And those people that had to go through the selection, sort of pointing right, left, were old people, disabled people, and also children, and also women holding children. And they tried to rip the child out of the woman's arm. The guards came over and they told her to put the child down. But of course she wouldn't. And in many cases, they even shot the baby. When it was finished, they marched them to the showers, so they told them. They packed them into that room, which you have seen. They closed those gates, those shutters. A German guard went up on a ladder, there was an opening there on top, and we threw some cyclone B gas. Within 20 minutes, all those people were there. Within one hour of arriving, of arriving in Auschwitz, Birkenau, those people were dead. And you know, even today, I ask myself the question, how can a human being do that daytime, and in the evening to sit down with his wife and children, listen to music and eating his dinner? You know, people would think I'm talking about hooligans or crooks or whatever they were. They were people with degrees, doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants that were doing it, not some thugs. For some reason, we don't know why, maybe because we were going to Germany to work, they didn't tattoo the numbers, but I had a number. And I looked at myself and I thought, I've got nothing now. My grandparents, I haven't got. My parents, I didn't have for a long time. I got no possessions, nothing. I haven't even got a name. All I am is 84,303. They took us on passenger trains, proper trains, and we arrived in a place called Stolp in Pomerania. It was a labor camp, there was 1,500 people there, only all Jewish. One day, five boys stole some tobacco that was going for the Germans, and they were caught, they put them in an isolation room. After a week, they let them out. We had to come to the square where they let them out. When we came there, we know what's going to happen. Those gallows with ropes hanging down, five ropes, put them on the stools, and a German officer, an SS officer, started reading out, prisoner number so-and-so, so-and-so is going to be hung because of. They couldn't finish the sentence, those boys jumped off to their death. They wouldn't let the Germans have the satisfaction of killing them. You know, I told you how dehumanized I was, and, but that scene has never, never left me. Whenever I talk about it, I think about it, I see five young, young men standing there, they were older than me, standing there. And 20 seconds later, they're hanging their dead. I cannot thank the British people what they did for me. Those boys that liberated me, that gave me my life, but not only my life. I've got two daughters, six grandchildren, eight months ago, the greatest thing a great-grandson. 
Latino, for a Holocaust survivor, that's lost almost everything. Having children, grandchildren, you know, when I look at them, I look up, look up to heaven, and I say, you see, Hitler did not succeed. He might have killed six millions of us, but he did not succeed. You approve. Three of my grandchildren already visited the camps, you know, and I tell everybody, you can, you know, you can read a book about it. You can watch a film about it. You can even hear a Holocaust survivor talking about it. But you cannot imagine till you've been there and you come back. Everybody I met said to me the same thing. If I live another thousand years, I could never forget what I have seen. And of course, my father. I know he came back in 1941 from Russia to Poland, like he never existed. And you know, like one of you said to me, uh, was it somebody said to me tonight, that his greatest thing was to stand there and say Kaddish. And I would like to have stood knowing where to go and say Kaddish. I say Kaddish every time I'm in a shul, you know. I'm Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or any time I go to shul, I say Kaddish, because I don't know when he died. People ask me, why do you do it? I mean, you're an old man. You, you'll be 84 in January. Because I feel I owe it to the people that haven't survived. I tell the young people, don't hate. We are all the same. What difference is it? Whether you're a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, it's only different places of worship at the end of the day. There's only one God. <laughs> 